And welcome back to the Windows Phone 8.1 Developer Jumpstart. Um, I'm Athash Shapiro, and I'm going to be talking about Universal Apps for Windows. That is what this session is about, and uh, we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive on how to build our Universal applications and how we use Visual Studio with, uh, to drive those applications and uh, what sort of patterns we're going to use to uh, build applications that are flexible and, and reusable and, most importantly, converge and shareable. Uh, so we're going to do a bit of a universal apps overview. A lot of this is going to be sort of remedial because we've been talking on and off about universal applications this entire time. Um, but I'm going to do uh, show a little bit of convergence summary. Uh, I'm going to show how we can take existing projects and turn them universal. Uh, and then we'll talk about code sh sharing strategy. And I'll show an application that has a, a universal shared application with a PCL and explain what the application is, why did we put this piece into the shared and this piece in the PCL and, and just what's a good architecture for creating the most reuse in our code and the most convergence in our apps. So the uh, universal apps overview. Uh, welcome to universal apps. If you're just joining us, um, universal apps. Where have you been? <laughs> right. <laughs> this is a very odd time to just join us uh, at, at session 23 or 22 of a 23 session jumpstart. Um, universal applications are applications on the converged Windows 8.1 8 and Windows Phone 8.1 platforms. Um, We've been talking about C Sharp this entire time, but you can also build converged applications in C++ uh, and XAML or in JavaScript or in C++ without XAML. Um, and uh, the easiest way to get started with these converged applications is to use the universal app projects uh, templates. And just, uh, uh, and you could, but you can also add a, a Windows 8.1 application to an existing Windows Phone application or a Windows Phone 8.1 application to an existing Windows 8.1 application. And that'll give you the pretty much the same template, the two application projects plus the shared project. Um, so how converged is Windows? We've been talking a lot about convergence. We've been showing a lot of convergence. Uh, but in fact, there is uh, this massive convergence. This is just a uh, diff of the APIs between Windows 8.1 SDK and the Windows Phone 8.1 SDK. And I completely stole this slide from Tim Pure, who showed it off in, uh, at Build uh, 2014. But because it comes from Tim, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I, I feel it's a pretty reliable, uh, reliable chart. And, and the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of the APIs have, uh, are converged between it's Windows and well Windows Phone. Well over 90%. It's well over 90%. And the ones that aren't converged are, are largely uh, APIs that have this very specific intent uh, for use on, a f uh, on phone or on Windows. Or uh, in some cases, there are APIs uh, for Windows that are basically kind of re resource constrained. And so or they, they, would, yeah, they would have to be resource constrained if you move them over to phone. So there are, for the ones and things that aren't converged, there are actually a lot of reasons behind that. So if we have an existing project and we want it co to convert it to universal, this, this applies only to Windows 8.1 projects and Windows Phone 8.1 projects. If you started out with a Windows 8.1 project and you want to add phone, or hey, you started with phone, you want to add Windows. And that's, uh, we have to remind everybody that when we're talking about Windows Phone 8.1 here, we're meaning WinRT XAML apps, yes. not Silverlight. Yes, yes. There is not a shared project between Silverlight and Windows no. 8.1 applications. Uh, but we can right-click on that application and go and add Windows Phone or Windows 8, 8.1. Uh, if we have API differences that we need to navigate, we can navigate those using the if compiler conditionals. You've probably, if you've been watching this whole time, you've probably seen us use this a couple of times uh, to sort out little differences between Windows and Phone in the APIs. Uh, the compiler conditionals, for the record, for Windows, it's uh, Windows underscore app. For Windows Phone, it's Windows underscore phone underscore app. And actually, these are defined. Going to the project properties, you can see yep. under the, um, what's it called, the compilation yep, it, tab. The, yeah, like the build tab. I yeah, think. the build tab, yeah. You can see uh, compiler conditionals are defined in there. So yep. the pro new project templates have these already baked into them. Yep, yep. Um, and so a great example of where you might use this is the hardware back button is Windows Phone only. So if you need to do something, if you need to hook into that hardware back button uh, and you know, maybe preload some data for the last screen or, or do something like that, 
then you're going to have to wrap that inside of an if compiler conditional. And that's where you're going to put your back button um, uh, event handler so you're not breaking your Windows application. Uh, so I'm going to actually walk through the process of taking a Windows 8.1 application and converting it to a universal app. Wish me luck. Um, there we go. Okay. So here we have our, our Windows 8.1 application. Uh, and I'm going to run it real quick. I say that a lot. I'm going to run this so that you can see. Um, oh, I have a. Do I have something already running? Let's close you down. Rebuild the application, maybe? That looks better. There we go. OK. So we're just getting a couple of uh, pictures off of, the, uh, off of our pictures. <clears throat> so um, for some inconceivable reason, you want a phone version of this awesome app? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so for phone, yeah, OK. I got my, my phone's plugged in. Good. Um, Okay, so this is pulling from the pictures uh, library, and this is, uh, this is a demo machine, so I ha we haven't saved a whole lot of pictures in there. I, I should have done that before we started. But uh, we just want to pull the pictures, and we want to look at all of our pictures, uh, and we can actually, inside of that application, which is now gone, um, we can tap on the picture and see a, a bigger version of it. So I'm going to right-click here, and I'm going to go to Add Windows Phone 8.1, and it tells me it's adding a Windows Phone 8.1 as a shared project. Uh, and so now we've got our Windows 8.1, our shared project. There's nothing in the shared one. There's, right, and there, right now, there's nothing in the shared one. So I'm going to grab my, my view model, models, and common information. I'm going to dump that into my shared project. Uh, I'm going to take my main image and my image view, and I'm going to dump that into my shared project. I'm going to get rid of my main page here, get rid of this and this. And these, after I make sure that all of the files came along with them. Yep, looks okay. So that's because you, you would end up with them duplicated. Because if yeah, it's a shared they, area and in the head, then right. you, you can't have the two files the same in the same place. Yeah, because the way that the shared project works is it just takes these files and it moves them into both projects yeah. at, at compilation. In fact, these shared, this shared fault project is exactly, the, it's a new way of doing adders and link. It's, it's, right. if, if any of you have used that before, it's like you've got a common folder, you stick some files in there, and the whole kind of, the old way of doing this would be you, you'd add existing files in as links rather than as actual physical copies. So, mm -hmm. And this is a new way of doing the same thing. Right, right. So uh, I'm not going to move the app.xaml because this is a demo, but I could. Uh, there are a couple of little things in app.xaml that are going to be Windows Phone specific or Windows specific. But honestly, you're also going to see those if you just open up like a new universal template, a blank template, or the hub template. Uh, all that stuff will be already uh, if conditionaled for you. So you can kind of take a look at what a shared app.xaml might look like. Um, OK, so we will, we're going to go and set our startup project to phone. Um, we're going to use the device. I've got my, oh, my happy little shared screen here. Run it. And XAML pause exception. Oh, OK. Well, let's go ahead and open up our main page and see what that might be. Uh, if you were here for our, um, I might, I have an idea. <laughs> yeah. If you were here for our previous, uh, for the, the tooling session, you'll know that one thing that we can do is, uh, we can actually open up a XAML file, open up a XAML file and change the context of that XAML file to be either Windows or Windows Phone. Uh, and then you, that you can do this with anything that's in the shared folder. This right. Is, this is one, effectively this file exists in two projects. Right. It exists in your Windows head and also in, in your phone head. So you can see and stuff will be, well, uh, stuff, some stuff will be valid yep. on and one. The, and here we can see this is what we're missing. We're actually missing our data context because we had defined it in our app.xaml and we hadn't moved that over yet. So we can grab that and toss it in our app.xaml along with the namespace, the namespaces that go along with it.
And I've got local in there twice, so we'll get rid of that. Now we run it again, and, and we should have that uh, resource resolved. And in fact, we do. And here is my incredibly blank pictures. Mm. Um, the reason that it is blank is because uh, we had we've been pulling from our uh, pictures library, which is a great place to pull if you are a um, if you're a desktop, but not such a great place to pull if you are a phone. So we're going to use our compiler conditional here to say, if you're a Windows app, pull from the pictures library. But if you are a Windows phone app, pull from the camera roll. And just like in our XAML, we can change the context of our IntelliSense with this, uh, this handy little toolbar up here. So you see that our, our uh, code colors go live depending on which context we're in. And am I missing something here? Um, it looks like this is not not loading up for some reason. Um, that's that's sad. Do you want to just make the font a bit bigger? bigger? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Here we go. Um, image library source. The data context should be there. We should be, everything should be working, and yet it is not. <laughs> um, so for whatever reason, that's, that doesn't seem to want to, to want to run, which is strange because I, uh, we literally showed this exact same application in the last session, and it, it was like working an delightfully. <laughs> um, so that is, uh, that's a great thing about that. Uh, but we are going to, I'm going to show one thing here. Um, this is kind of fun. It actually runs in the um, in the uh, off of the, the the data, our pictures data, inside of the designer for Windows. Um, but you see that we have we have our Windows application. Uh, the My Pictures looks fine, but we can see that it's all cut off when we're using uh, the Windows Phone version. And the interesting, uh, this is kind of fun because this allows us to uh, show off our device. Uh, pane, which will open now. Okay, um, the device pane allows us to switch devices within the design area, um, so we can go and see that uh, at certain device sizes, this might look fine, uh, but at smaller ones, it's going to look poor. Uh, and this is a lesson in uh, adaptive UI. You see, our row definition is not designed, is, is set to a proportion of a screen. And so uh, it's not going to resize itself to fit the area that uh, the My Pictures element requests. So if we go and set it to auto instead, now it is. Now it's no longer cut off, uh, and we have a design that's going to work on our small screens as well as one that's going to work on our, our bigger screens. Um, so trying to think what else I was going to show uh, along with this. Um, I showed uh, in the, if you go back to a di diagnostics and tooling, I was showing off some of the, the XAML uh, opportunities that we have inside of, uh, inside of Visual Studios. And so I can, I can run over that again, but I don't think it's probably not a very good use of our time since it's already in session 20. Um, so if that had been working, I really want to know why that's not working. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, give me. Uh, I'm actually not too bad on time right now, so I am gonna. Okay, so we've got our. It does go to load images. It hits the folder. You've got the capability. Oh, there you go. 
There you go. I wish uh, it should have uh, been throwing me an error on that, shouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, should have gotten an exception. Okay, I should have gotten an exception for this, but I wasn't getting it. Okay, that's right. We need to uh, go here and check our, our pictures <laughs> library. I'm going to go ahead and check videos as well. Um, because our app package manifest, our package.app manifest is not shared between our two applications. Uh, and so this means that... It's like lack of uh, try-catch going on there as well. Yeah, perhaps. maybe, yeah. maybe yeah. a little it's bit. Swallowed exception stuff <laughs> going on there. This is a case study in poor programming, I'm <laughs> Yeah. The other demo is better. <laughs> um, okay, now if we run it, uh, we'll see it hits all of our all of our touch points <laughs> still and we still it. not still don't see the uh, on property changed images image um, okay um, I'm not a hundred percent on this right now then uh, well, if, it's, move if it's not gonna be move doing on. that yeah nothing to yeah, see here right see here <laughs> what on earth okay we're just gonna we're gonna move back um, yeah, there's there's so there's a thing with this, but uh, <laughs> come on, come on, toolbar, you can do it. All right, we're just gonna all tab our way back here. Um, so, I mean, hopefully, hopefully, what you saw with that demo was that it was very easy to create a new application to pull all of our files there. Now, maybe um, you know, if you wrote your application better, it would work a little bit better. Um, but it's it's easy to debug. We are we you can see we were running all of the same code. We were running all of the same XAML, uh, and it was as easy as grabbing it and just kind of dragging it over. Uh, as you can see, there's you've got a th there are going to be these little pieces. There are going to be you probably are going to be missing some resources, especially if you're using the system resources. Um, but the good news about that is that there are also uh, and actually I am going to show that piece because I do have time. Um, when you have uh, a piece of XAML that is in your shared project and you decide that you want to uh, give it a style, um, you start for your application, um, the IntelliSense uh, gives you uh, controls that are styleable across both platforms, I think. I don't remember body text blocks out. No, okay, yeah. So. Uh, all of the styles that you see here uh, in the IntelliSense are things that are going to work on Windows and Windows Phone. Okay. So code sharing strategies. This is going to be all new stuff. There are a lot of different ways to share code uh, in Windows 8.1 and Windows uh, Phone 8.1. The big one, the one that we've been talking a lot about uh, because it's the easiest one and it's really effective is that shared project files. Uh, there are very few restrictions on what you can put into the shared project files. It accepts most file types. You do images and assets and uh, um, localization files and XML, pretty much everything. And that's because it just goes and grabs that and sucks all of that data, uh, all of those files into both projects. Another way we can share, uh, share files and libraries is through a portable class library. Um, we can, the, this way we can share both libraries and Windows runtime components, uh, and I'll show the, the ways that we can do that. And the last way is to use add as link to share files. Now, this is a particular uh, use case that I'm gonna call out because this doesn't make a lot of sense. If the only thing we care about is universal applications, if we're only doing Windows 8.1 and Windows Phone, uh, 8.1 add link doesn't make as much sense because added add because it's, it's the same have, as the shared yeah, we've project. been doing that yeah. already. Yeah, and actually, but I, you I think you're about to say if you <laughs> share code with like a Silverlight app, yep. for example, mm -hmm. then add as link starts to make sense because right. you cannot have a a shared solution with a Silverlight project and a WinRT project and a, and a shared folder. That right. um, that isn't going to work. Right. So. Um, the shared project, I said this al uh, already, and we're going to say it again, uh, shared source between converged apps. It has no binary input, and it supports all, all types of items. Um, shared XAML components. Um, so if you have a XAML component, and it's cross-platform XAML, uh, you can use the Visual State Manager to handle some of your layout changes. This is a very, very simple version of how you might do something like that. It, it's an interesting one, this, isn't it? Right. Because <laughs> actually, you know, if you create a hub project or, you know, use the new project template, you create mm -hmm. a pivot, uh, 
sorry, we're talking about universal ones. So yes, yeah, you yeah, create yeah. a hub one, for example, yep. which is a, a fully functioning, rich application. Uh, the new project templates will give you all your XAML files. Um, it will duplicate them. It'll have mm -hmm. one version for Windows and one version for Windows Phone. And, and it, that kind of makes some sense because mm -hmm. they are going to look you're going to create a different user experience on a tablet than you are on a phone. They're different size screens. They used, they may be using different orientations naturally. They're obviously different sizes. So yep. the, what you're going to show on the phone app compared to your tablet app is going to be, you know, you, this is it. You're going to tailor it. We we recognize you're going to want to tailor that user experience to make the most of both of these platforms. Right. So having two separate XAML files, one in, in, in each head, is the easy way of doing that. Yep. But you are duplicating some stuff. So right. what you're saying here is actually just have XAML files once, put them in the shared folder, yep. but then handle those differences in user experience in a different way, which is this Visual State Manager. Right, yeah. And so, and the, so the Visual State Manager, you, could, you don't have to create a Windows and Windows Phone Visual State. In fact, we don't really recommend it. It can, <laughs> it can get complicated. It, well, it can get thing, very right? complicated. Yeah. Right, right. Um, but but this is, uh, I felt that this was a really simple way of kind of explaining the Visual State Manager. And we're actually going to see, I use this for demo purposes in the next demo. So we'll look at exactly how that's done. Uh, and then uh, you could switch between your states in the code behind of your XAML file and simply say, OK, if I'm in a Windows app, go to the Windows Visual State Manager. If I'm in a Windows Phone app, go to the Windows Phone State Manager. Um, if you want more information about uh, doing uh, adaptive UI, something that's a, a little bit more comprehensive than a simple Windows, Windows Phone binary switch, uh, check out session six on adaptive UI for different screens. Uh, portable class libraries. For Windows, if, all, if our portable class library is just targeting our Windows Universal application, uh, we can actually support uh, WinRT APIs, uh, the Windows Runtime APIs. Yeah, because uh, this has been a, an interesting technology for a few years. Yep. But, but up till now, you've only been able to support .NET APIs. In mm -hmm. it. So, you know, it's it's kind of been interesting, but the, the use cases have been a little bit narrow. But yep. now, with this one, they've got the whole WinRT APIs available if you target Windows 8.1 right. or Windows Phone 8.1. Right. Clearly, if you throw Silverlight in there or You're dot, right. .NET Framework 4 as Things well. Are gonna, yeah, they're going to yeah, constrain you, back every, down there. Every time you add a new platform into the supported list for the PCL, you're narrowing the cross, because it all it yep. just supports the cross section of APIs that exactly. are available in all of them. So Yeah, yeah. So, but but, yeah, but it, you know, it's, still, it's still a decent way to do libraries if you have a library that you really want to use across multiple applications. If it's just one application, a PCL doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If, it's, if you're building a library for cross application development, then it, it's really starting to make sense to well, build you know, your... And a lot of devs, you, you'll, have, you'll end up, if you're building apps for any period of time, you end up with kind of utility classes and yep. common stuff that you use over and over again. And mm -hmm. it kind of makes sense maybe to build that out in a PCL that you can just pull in and, and reuse over and over and not have to kind of cut and copy and paste code around. Exactly. Uh, one very cool element that has been introduced to PCLs is that you can go into your PCL properties and you can select an output type, and you can select a Windows runtime component. And what that means is that uh, you can expose those libraries. You could write in C Sharp and expose those libraries to a C++ application or a JavaScript application. And so all of a sudden, a PC, uh, the PCL that you build one time doesn't just span multiple projects. It spans multiple coding scenarios. Uh, so that, I think that's pretty exciting. It seems pretty cool. Um, but uh, we can also use portable class libraries for broad targeting of Windows Phone 8 uh, and .NET frameworks. Uh, but as we said before, uh, you see in my uh, my image has changed so that I'm now targeting you know .NET framework and Windows Phone Silverlight 8. Um, but that's going to constrain our API set. Uh, doesn't make it useless as you'll as we'll see in a minute. But it, it does. It uh, we're we're going to lose the ability to do Windows runtime uh, APIs. And then that last one, uh, add is link. Uh, you can, uh, if you want to add a file, you can you go through the normal add dialog, and then at the very end, you'll uh, there'll be a, uh, an arrow on the button, and you click on that arrow, and it gives you the option to add as link. And every add is linked file, every linked file will show up with this little blue icon on it. Uh, and if you're using this across, for example, uh, a universal application, maybe a Silverlight 8 application, a uh, uh, that you're still supporting. You can use compiler conditional to share across those two platforms. So the code sharing architecture, um, 
I, I have dumbed this down in the interest of, so I am, a, I am a, an MVVM fanatic and I've done tons of talks on MVVM and I love using MVVM and I didn't want to dive down that rabbit hole because I, we could get lost for hours talking about it. So the very simple version of uh, code sharing architecture is that we want to keep in mind our separation of concerns. We're trying really hard to decouple our UI from the logic that drives our application. Uh, so in a very simple general way, uh, the UI is, will live in our Windows and Windows Phone projects. This isn't, this isn't every single UI, this isn't all the time, uh, but generally speaking, our Windows is going to have a different UI than our Windows Phone. And so it makes sense to have that XAML, uh, the, the XAML pages for, one, or for Windows in the Windows project and the XAML pages for the phone in the phone project. Um, we're also, if we have some platform-specific API sets, something like geolocation or media or sensors uh, that has a very specific application in between the two platforms, it might make sense to put those files in the project-specific folders. Uh, but the logic should, generally speaking, live in the shared project. Like I said, there are a couple of exceptions to this rule. Uh, but if you find yourself building all of your lo a lot of logic in Windows, your Windows 8 project, copying the code and pasting it into Windows Phone, that's probably a pretty good sign that that file could, could more effectively live inside of your shared folder. Um, it's also a good place to put XAML components that make sense. Um, the, XAML's a, a great uh, platform for building these componentized UIs and sucking those components into our pages to do specific things. And if that's how you build, bravo for you. That's great. You might want to, uh, thinking about making your XAML components cross-platform so that you're only building them one time uh, is a great idea. So we're going to look at a universal application with a PCL. And, um, and this is going to be interesting and fun. Um, Okay, we're going to make sure this runs first before I, I have us switch the camera. <laughs> okay, switch the camera. Uh, so this is a, uh, what, what we call the Hue lights, Philip Hue lights. And uh, these lights are Wi-Fi enabled, uh, and you can control them using, so you can I control them with a Wi-Fi bridge. And what I have here is uh, a Hue lights enabled application. And I can change the color of my lights, and I can change the brightness of my lights. I can get these brightness all the way down, um, and so you can see that this is a this is a nice kind of fun way to play with my uh, the lights in my home using my uh, my Windows tablet. These are Wi-Fi lights. These are Wi-Fi lights. Isn't that That's isn't that radical? Pretty awesome, that. Yeah. So uh, you can see I've got. Uh, it looks like I've got something that would work pretty well as a component, right? Uh, it's the same thing three times, all the same controls. And we've got some, some cool bindings. Let's jump in and look at what uh, that component looks like. I have too many things open. Okay. So um, actually, let's, let's start. Let's put that component off for a minute, and let's actually look at what this project looks like. Okay. You see I have is, uh, uh, remind me how to do zoom on, is it alt, Windows Z, uh, yeah, okay, um, control Y, control one, Windows one, no, ah, oh, come on, um, this is just my day. <laughs> um, okay, so hopefully you can see this, I wish I could zoom in on it, I've completely, my mind is blanking on what my zoom key is. Um, but we, this, uh, we, this is a universal application. It's got a, uni hu a universal Windows phone, a uh, Windows application, a phone application, a portable class library, and I'm supporting a uh, Windows Phone Silverlight 8 application for all the people who are still using Windows Phone Silverlight phones, like uh, my, my dear wife. So what, go, what did we put in where? Let's, I want to start with PCL because that's kind of the lowest level of APIs. This PCL is being used in my universal application. It's being using, used in my uh, Silverlight application. I've got some helpers in here. Uh, I've got some mathematics to change RGB to hue and saturation uh, numbers. I've got some models. These are models that uh, represent my, uh, my hue Wi-Fi bridge and my hue lights so that I can, uh, I can just rep uh, use those objects and interact with them. 
I have this service, and this is using the HTTP client library for portable class libraries, uh, and this is all of my communication, every piece of communication that I have with my Hue, uh, my Hue API is inside of here. Everything from user, user registration, um, yeah, uh, no. Uh, everything from user registration to uh, uh, to connecting to the Wi-Fi bridge to communicating with the lights themselves, uh, everything is inside of this uh, this service. Uh, and then I can put some view models in here. I don't have one, uh, but I could put view models in here and share those across my my applications. But instead, what I've done if I, is I've actually put my view models, which are driving the vast bulk of my logic, inside of my universal application. Let me open up my client view model. And you can see this is, uh, this, is a, this is not really, this is, sort of, this is a demo application in the sense that I use it for demos. But this is a very serious application, right? We've got a lot of properties. Uh, we've got commands for updating all of our different lights. We've got commands for cycling our lights. Uh, we've got uh, uh, update commands so that I, uh, if I'm using this application on multiple devices, I want both devices to keep up to date on uh, what the color of the lights are so that they'll update automatically if I change it on a different device. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, but it's, uh, it's stuff that I don't need to worry about uh, sharing because it's everything here is business logic. Uh, every, yeah, everything is business logic. It's easily shared between my Windows Phone and Windows application. I've got my uh, some converters, uh, a boolean to usability, a uh, boolean to visibility converter, a pretty standard, nice standard converter for people who've been in the uh, in the XAML space for a while, um, along with my reverse boolean to visibility converter. I got some color converters, which are just helpers for my UI, uh, my my hue classes. But the thing I, I want to look at specifically is this hue light control. I'm going to open this up. And actually, the best place to open this up is inside of Blend. Which has apparently never been opened before <laughs> on this machine. Um, so we're going to build this in Blend, because sometimes we have to do that to get stuff to, uh, to show up. Um, this really kills my use of blend here. <laughs> um, that's that's devastating. Okay. Um, I wonder if it's too late to Wi-Fi bridge into my or to go into my it other application. Oh gosh. Okay. Um, okay. Let me show you what the what we're doing with the Visual State Manager here. Here we have a, a Windows and a Windows Phone Visual State Manager, and I really wish that this was running because uh, inside of Blend, you can actually select that visual state and it will show you exactly what that component will look like inside of that visual state. So what would have happened if I could go into Blend is I go into Blend, I'd select the visual state with the UI that you saw in the, in the presentation, and it would show me this is what it's going to look like when it's on Windows Phone, this is what it's going to look like when it's in Windows. Uh, and what I actually have ended up, uh, end up doing is uh, on, on Windows Phone, I don't have all that space for my, my light at the top. And so what I, instead I've done is I've taken out the, uh, uh, the text at the bottom because it's just going to be too small to read on a phone. Uh, I move the light back behind the control because it's not interactable. We don't really need it to take up that much space on the phone. Uh, and then I shift around this, the, uh, uh, the space for the red, green, and blue uh, in indicators. Uh, and so then uh, my control looks different on Windows Phone as it does on Windows. It's, it's specifically designed for, uh, uh, for the platform that it's on. Now, why, don't I, why didn't I move the main page.xaml into that universal shared uh, platform? The reason I didn't was because Um, the reason I didn't was because uh, I'm using a pivot, and that's just—it's just a great way to control these uh, these images on my Windows Phone 
uh, application. I may have that installed if I can. I don't have to run it from here. You just pull it up so we can see it. Nope, not gonna work. All right, that's fine. Um, okay. Um, I actually have an example of what, okay, so this is the phone UI that you can see here. It's not connected, it's not running, but at least you can see what's going on. Uh, and I can move in between all of my different lights and I can control my lights uh, in a way that really makes a lot of sense in the phone and that the pivot control is really well suited for. But we don't have a pivot control in, uh, in Windows 8, and so we have our own main page, uh, our own main page.xaml application, or uh, file. And inside of that, we have the same thing, just the three hue light controls the three hue light controls, and all we have to do is set the data context on each one and listen for an event handler, the light changed event handler. And every time the light changes inside of the control, it's gonna uh, run that event handler and we can hook into our view model, send that message out and change our light. Um, and one more thing, uh, jumping back to the hue light control that I wanted to point out is that here is that visual state manager go to state that we saw uh, saw previously. Just as soon as I uh, initialize the control, I go and I look at that the the state of that. Con uh, I, I go and I say, okay, where am I? Am I in, am I running this control from a Windows application or from a Windows Phone application? Uh, and pick the appropriate state manager for uh, uh, for that particular scenario. And so uh, that's. That covers the why we put stuff in the shared file, why we put stuff in the portable class library, and I want to touch just briefly on that uh, linked file. So I actually am sharing my view models, the view models that I have inside of my shared folder here in my Silverlight application. And when I go into my Silverlight application, uh, I can open those up. You see, I'm using a compiler conditional to manage uh, just a couple of UI or uh, a couple of namespace differences between my Silverlight application and my Windows application. And you can see that, um, yep. Uh, and so that's really all it took. Uh, there are a couple of differences there. There are some dispatcher differences uh, between the Silverlight model and the Windows, uh, uh, the Windows runtime model. But for the most part, we've got a, a view model uh, that's driving uh, a fairly sub substantial application. Well, a reasonable little application. It's a toy. Uh, and it's, uh, we're sharing all of that logic between uh, not just our Windows and Windows Phone applications, uh, but between our older Windows Phone application. So this is going to make maintaining the application across all these platforms much, much easier. And because I have been, uh, because my demos have been running so poorly in this presentation, uh, that is all I have. And we're actually a little bit under time. Oh, so, time. <laughs> right, I catch up a little bit there. Yeah, cool. But, um, so it's a universal application, uh, or universal and shared projects, PCLs to drive uh, some more abstract parts of that application. Uh, and share his link to uh, help bridge the gap between maybe older uh, or, or more diverse projects that we might have. Cool, great. Uh, coming up next is? So uh, we're nearly at the end of the jumpstart. We've got yep. one to go. Okay. And the next one is going to look at uh, our topics specifically for Silverlight developers, about Silverlight 8.1, about um, retargeting your apps from 8.0 to 8.1, uh, and from the some of the the issues or the, the ways that you have to program around using some of the WinRT APIs. So please join us for that. Well, hello there and welcome back. Uh, this is the final session of this year's uh, Building Apps for Windows Phone 8.1 Jumpstart. Uh, this topic, this one is all about Silverlight apps on Windows Phone 8.1. Uh, it's last not because Silverlight isn't, it's not, you know, 
because we, we hate it. In fact, we love it. We've been building with it for years. And the good news is with Windows Phone 8.1, uh, all uh, the majority of the goodness that's come with this release is available to you if your skills are Silverlight uh, application development. Uh, there's loads of loads of uh, commonality between uh, Windows Runtime XAML and Silverlight XAML, but the kind of framework, the way the apps behave, is a little bit different. So uh, switching from one to the other is kind of non-trivial. Uh, there's a you know the concepts are the same, the way the apps run is the same, but the, the way the app lifecycle works, for example, you know, and, uh, it's, there's there's enough differences. So I, we're going to focus specifically on that. So I'm assuming if you're watching this that you are an existing Windows Phone app developer. Hi. Uh -huh. Uh, or you're a Windows runtime developer, kind of curious what this other alternative uh, alternative universe is all about. So, so in this session, uh, we're just going to have a quick recap on what the XAML frameworks are. What, why have we got these choices? And why would you want to stay on Windows Phone Silverlight? Why, when would you move to, uh, to WinRT XAML? Then we're going to look at a specific case study. We're going to take a Silverlight 8.0 version of our old friend, the Contoso cookbook, <laughs> and upgrade it to Silverlight 8.1. We're going to look at what that means to the app. There are, it does introduce some changes to behavior. Some of them subtle, some of them you're going to have to kind of uh, do some careful testing. And uh, then there's also, uh, we're going to look at the changes to tiles and notifications. You've got a choice there between staying with MPNS or moving over to WNS. So um, there's, then there's a loads of great value you can add by moving to Silverlight 8.1. So we're going to add some new stuff just to kind of drill that home. So yeah, we've got these two flame frameworks on Windows Phone 8.1, which we call Windows Runtime XAML and Silverlight XAML. So Silverlight, of course, is the one that people have been using for building uh, apps for Windows Phone for a good, uh, good many years now. It sits up there on the top right. This, this kind of broad block diagram is um, it's sitting up there on the top row because it is, Windows Phone Silverlight is a premier technology for building the UI out of your apps. Um, as are the other ones to its left there, shown on there, DirectX for games, um, Windows XAML, Windows Runtime XAML is the new one, and that gives you all the goodness of the universal apps and being able to share loads of your code and, and as uh, Mathias showed there, so, and your XAML as well, if you want, uh, between a Windows app and a Windows Phone app. Uh, or you've got WinJS, got, you can build your UI out with HTML and have your, your logic alongside it implemented in JavaScript. You've got all of these are equally first class citizens in terms of building out your UI layer for your app. Now I'm focusing on the UI layer there because underneath that was all the blocks for the Windows runtime. And in a Silverlight 8.1 app, you've got access to all of those Windows, run, Windows runtime APIs, all the goodness that's in there, all the stuff we've been talking about all of yesterday, all of that you've got. So it, you're not you're not kind of a you know a deprecate. We're not talking about a deprecated platform here. You're not talking about one that is is got not getting any love from us. It, it <laughs> totally does. You totally get access to all of this this great new APIs. So you know we started back with Windows Phone 7.0, and we obviously this is when Silverlight, as it is, came came as the app technology for XAML app based development. It's not the same as the browser plugin. This is take, it was the same XAML, which is why it kept the name. But uh, in actual fact, in the browser plugin, there was a way you could install an app from the browser and install it onto the desktop. So you could kind of like, well, this is the desktop, but not with the browser bit. So we were using the same XAML and the same uh, uh, the code behind to, to create um, native apps for Windows Phone 7. And then we added to it. We added loads of APIs in Windows Phone 7 for 5, still Silverlight XAML. And then we get to Windows Phone 8. It's still Silverlight XAML. Um, and then we get to Windows Phone 8.1, and this is where we get these choices because we brought Windows Runtime XAML uh, down from uh, big windows, and that is now available for Windows Phone as well, which is what opens up. If you adopt Windows Runtime XAML uh, as your framework, you can build these universal apps that share loads of code between Windows and Windows Phone. Uh, talking about Windows, of course, Windows 8.0 has been when Win Runtime, Windows Runtime XAML came in, um, and that also got uh, an upgrade when we moved to Windows 8.1. So this, this is the kind of the family of, uh, of XAMLs that we've got out there. So if, you're, if you've got an existing, if your skills are Windows Phone Silverlight app development, you've been building apps for Windows Phone, 
why would you want to stay on that? Well, why, or why should you move to uh, win RT XAML? Well, obviously you've got all those skills. You've got the existing investment. You know how these apps work. So, um, and you can very easily take your 8.0 app and, uh, and create an 8.1 version of it and stay in Silverlight. So you don't have to rework all your UI to get your apps running on Windows Phone 8.1. There are a few features listed there under not yet converged, like um, camera lens apps, where the ca in the camera you can select a special lens, like a panorama and the, uh, the, or the new office one, where you can kind of use your phone like a, like a scanner. Um, they're, they're only Silverlight, and there's a number of others there that you can see that are only Silverlight, voice over IP, lock screen, uh, apps that can, do, can change the lock screen background, and things like that. So there's a few, um, and that not many, but there's a few that are Silverlight only. And it's all about, we're saying to you, you know, we recognize you've invested all this time in getting up to speed and becoming a skilled Silverlight app developer. We want you to be able to continue to use those skills and move on to WinRT XAML when, when it's ready for you or when the time is right. So if you're going to stay with Silverlight 8.0, obviously you could carry on building with Silverlight 8.0 and any apps that you create using that existing skill set and the existing APIs will run just great on Windows Phone 8.1 devices as well as Windows Phone 8 devices. Um, why would you want to then take your Silverlight 8.0 app and retarget it up to 8.1? Once you retarget it, that version will only run on 8.1 phones. So, um, and, but you can kind of maintain two versions of your app and install and have them both being sold through the store. So you could have an 8.0 app version of your app and then alongside it you could have an 8.1 version of your app. In the 8.1 version of the app, of course, you can take advantage of all these new APIs we've been talking about over the last couple of days. So access to SD cards and, and the geofencing to take a couple of examples and single sign-on, the share contract and, and kind of loads of more of them. These days, the loads more of them. You can get access to all of these new uh, Win 80, uh, Windows Phone 8.1 WinRT APIs. <laughs> there are lots of them. I'm not even going to start going walking through these. This is what we have been spending all this time talking about. And this is, you know, with the WinRT WinRT API. Um, we've got 90% of the WinRT API is, uh, is converged with big windows and is available for Windows Phone um, 8.1 apps, whether that's WinRT XAML or Silverlight XAML. Um, there are this, this, small, this, this is the feature set that is only available in Silverlight. Um, I already said this. <laughs> so let's have a look at the demo retargeting your app to Silverlight 8.1. Okay, here we've got a, um, an, a, our old friend, the uh, Contoso cookbook. Um, it's actually, this is actually the version I built in the Windows Phone 8.0 Jumpstart. Yeah, awesome. It lives again. It's yeah. still with us. But now I want to create a new version of it and add some stuff to it. So um, actually, here we go. It is an 8.0. I'll just draw this on the edge of the window out so you can see. It is indeed a Silverlight 8 app. So how do we retarget this to 8.1? Uh, well, it's really hard. You say retarget to Windows Phone 8.1. It puts up a pop-up says, you know, you're going to upgrade this project, retarget it to Phone 8.1. Uh, it, it advises you to take a backup. Um, and then it says confirm that you say, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, well, that's it, actually. What has happened? We've got another manifest. So we've now got two manifests. Uh, we've got the old wmapmanifest.xml, which you still use. And we've got a new manifest, which is a kind of cut-down version of the WinRT version of the manifest, which this one has a subset of the stuff you see in the full package.apex manifest, which you get in a WinRT app. Um, and it's used for, setting, uh, for settings that are uh, appropriate, that are required in order to use the new WinRT 8.1 APIs. Um, things like, here we go, so it's already got background tasks in this. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Now you see the old one had a background task in it and it's already upgraded it to use the new background task that infrastructure. Is, that is and pretty cool. Nice. And you can, uh, you can add other ones, additional background tasks, file open pickers, file safe mm -hmm. pickers. Because yeah, that's the other thing, you upgrade to 8.1, you've got your old background tasks you're still running, but within the new framework, you can, you can create new ones like the geofencing uh, triggers and all the new triggers you can add yep. into your Silverlight app. So loads of good reasons for doing it. Um, now, I'm just going to run this and just to show you, um, uh, oh, that didn't happen when I tried it. Um, oh, well, that's because, oh, that's interesting. Um, the, this is required, this is, um, 
got a reference to the uh, Windows Microsoft Phone Controls Toolkit, um, which have we got that for um, in? Uh, have we got a version of that for eight one yet? The toolkit? No, not yet. Okay, just remove that, and then uh, build. And I think uh, that's not going to fix the problem. I'm hoping there's not going to be. Um, let's get rid of this one. Now that um, absolutely didn't happen before. That's kind of weird. Um, um, what's the proper version of that? Um, Root framing is new. Um, phone application frame is it? What is it? Uh, hold on, I've actually got it here because I had that Silverlight application. Phone application frame. It oh, is you got it. Okay. Frame. Okay. Um, it depends if I've used any other stuff in the toolkit. Ooh. Okay. Oh I've got a bomb here. Uh, let me. F I did build this before and it worked. What was? What is going on here? <laughs> It's that it's it's there's something in the air today. It's, it's that that kind of day. Now oh, this is the 8.1. This is weird. That's the same project, and I just upgraded it before, and it, it worked. And then this one. Anyway, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dig into that because what I really wanted to show. No. This is now a Silverlight 8.1 version, upgraded in rehearsal and <laughs> live. It's let me down. But anyway, I can show you what I wanted to show because uh, you know we can go off to uh, recipe. And this is working just the same. It's a, we haven't added any new functionality. It looks like it's working absolutely brilliant. Now, I've got this really cool feature in this where you can take a picture of your, you know, you cook something and you think, oh, that's really cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my snapshot. So you have to imagine this block of colors actually is a picture of this dish you've just created. Uh, and we're going to take a snapshot of it. And uh, that's real nice. So, you know, we've now got a picture of, uh, there's our picture, uh, which is when we created it, our picture of our, um, so we're on that screen. Now, um, Let's just um, uh, suspend our app, mm -hmm. like we've always done. Uh, it's just suspended, you know, so this sort of thing, you know. Right. It's, right. And, and then we're going to go back to it and watch what happens. No, not what, no, hang on. What I wanted to do is suspend it, so it's suspended. And then I'm going to launch it all over again. So um, I'm gonna, you could go to the tile or I can go to the apps program. So yeah. as you know, oh, what happened there? So as you know, with Silverlight apps, when you launch it from the programs menu or from the tile, it actually launches a fresh copy all over again. So any saved copy is blown away. Right. Um, and we actually what happened there, uh, and that would happen with the 8.0 version, but with this upgraded version, something weird has happened. We're on the main page, but there's nothing shown. There's no data. So this is just illustrating to you, when you upgrade, don't assume it's just going to work. There are some changes that you need to, uh, so just the message is just test, which of course you will do, don't you? <laughs> um, don't just right click, say, oh, I've got an 8.1 version, I'm gonna ship it. And so uh, I'm gonna come back to that in a moment and explain why, why this has failed and what's gone wrong here. Um, actually, one point, it's worth saying about why it failed, why the original version, why when I right clicked and retargeted is because references don't get upgraded automatically. So if you're referencing any third party packages, um, you need those third party uh, package providers to upgrade their, to do a Silverlight 8.1 version of it. Uh, there isn't a Windows Phone toolkit just yet. Um, I guess there will be very soon. I've heard rumblings. Uh, yes, <laughs> it will be very soon, um, especially for this, because so you have to re-add your references, and I have no idea. I'm just thankful that it did work in rehearsal, because otherwise I wouldn't have anything to show you, but I <laughs> don't know quite what happened there. Anyway, moving on. So this is, uh, this is getting digging down into why we had that failure in, in starting a new instance of the app there. So when you upgrade from Silverlight 8.0, to Silverlight 8.1, it's not just simply adding some new, uh, you know, new artwork and, and a new package app, Apex Manifest. It actually completely changes the in runtime environment in which your app executes. So it's actually running in, well, I've called it, the, we, there seems to be a lot of confusion as to what we should call this. Some people call it the modern host and some call it new WinRT host. But either way, what you're, what you're doing is previously a Silverlight 8.0 app, even running on a Windows Phone 8.1 device is running in its nice familiar Silverlight little app execution framework and, and stuff happens the way it always has and that's, in life is good. But when you retarget a Silverlight 8.1, what you're actually doing is shifting your, the way, where your app operates over to the same runtime, ex, runtime execution environment that WinRT apps run into. And they're running side by side. 
This is part of the magic that's happened that allows you to get access to all the new Windows Phone 8.1 WinRT RP APIs. And you get this package app manifest. Um, but it, you can also use your Silverlight background agents and your WinRT background tasks together at the same time. So this is, a, this is the diagram I was just talking about there. When you retarget, you change the whole execution framework. So you actually shift in all the way over from uh, the Silverlight execution stack to the modern execution stack, the WinRT execution stack. It's the same place that the WinRT XAML apps are running in. This is why you get access to all the new good, new cool stuff. But it does introduce a bit of a few changes. Now, there is quite a lot. A lot of them are very subtle. Um, some of, some of these are CLR Silverlight bug fixes. So you, you get things like um, you, you, you run some API in a Silverlight 8.0 app. When you retarget and run the exact same code in, in when it's upgraded to Silverlight 8.1, you, you'll get an exception being thrown that you didn't have before. That's because actually with Silverlight 8.1, they've kind of, we've kind of taken the uh, chance to fix some bug fixes. <laughs> so, you know, you've got this kind of weird situation where your Silverlight 8.0 app was expecting certain behaviors from the CLR at libraries, the APIs it's calling, um, which actually maybe, you know, we've looked at it and said, we've had some people saying, oh, that's not right. And you, you said, oh, actually, you're right. You're, that, that's a bug, you know. Right. So we fixed it in 8.1, but that means your code, which kind of was expecting the broken behavior, all of a sudden doesn't behave the same way. So. Go and read the docs. There's this platform compatibility and breaking changes for Windows Phone Silverlight 8.1 apps topic in MSDN. Go and have a read of that, which kind of takes you through some of these issues. Now, uh, background execution. I, we kind of alluded to this. Um, not only, there's some good news and bad news with this, okay? So in a Silverlight 8.0 app, of course, you've got your foreground app, and you can run periodic and resource-intensive background agents. Uh, those are the background tasks flavors we have in Silverlight 8.0. Then we have these other ones, the background audio player agent and the audio streaming agent. And we also have this thing called CBE, continuous background execution, which is kind of running in the background, but actually it's, it's not the same as a background agent. It's, you can think of it more like a foreground app that's allowed to keep on running with no UI. So this is used for turn-by-turn -turn navigation and for run trackers, that kind of stuff. So you, know, you start tracking your run, you turn the screen off and stick it into your pocket or into a, say, something on your arm, and then you, off, you go off on your run and you get back, and, and yeah, maybe it can talk to you. There's, um, there's an app I use that gives you a training plan that's really good and tells you to speed up and nags you, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, that's running without using in the screen. It's running, continuously running in the background. So that's what you can do in a Silverlight 8.0 app. Silverlight 8.1, yeah, like I said, there's good news and there's bad news. So your periodic and resource intensive background agents still move across. And we saw that in the upgraded Contoso cookbook I had there. And you get all of the new triggers, all this great stuff, the, uh, uh, the geofencing, the Bluetooth, Bluetooth LE, time zone, but, you know, Connection, servicing yeah, yeah. complete, oh, yeah. all this great stuff. Um, but you can't use the old Silverlight 8.0 background audio stuff, and you cannot do CBE, run trackers and turn-by-turn -turn navigation at all. At least with the background audio, you can replace it with the WinRT background audio. CBE, I'm afraid, you're going to have to stay in Silverlight 8.0. Uh, the, the, the modern runtime, the WinRT execution environment, just has no concept of having a, a foreground app kind of continuing to run. It, it doesn't support it at the moment. Now, all of these we're kind of, you know, we're, we're looking at, and for future releases we'll try and fix, plug these holes. But, but now for a run tracker and turn by turn, you're going to have to stay with 8.0. Yeah, I think the, the idea with turn by turn and run tracker is that the geofencing is such a powerful and uh, flexible and persistent way of running background execution that that should be able to be good enough. You can kind of do the same thing in right, a right, different right. way. But yeah, you're certainly yeah. not going to be able to port your code over. No, no. Like, <laughs> yeah. No, you're going to have to, it's going to be a whole new model yeah. of how to do it. Yeah. Um, so let's let's add a new feature to our app, even though it's a bit broken at the moment, um, as you know. We're, I'm going to come back to that start restart behavior in a moment. But I do want to just um, add some new stuff, just to illustrate how we can add really exciting new features to our app. Um, that, you know, that page where we just took a photograph, the recipe detail page, this guy, um, we can add some interesting uh, new stuff on there. So uh, on, uh, oh, I could build it. Got some invalid markup on there. Why is that? Oh, I know, I know. This is the, yeah, don't worry about this. Um, that's, that's uh, I think it's something to do with the, the uh, 
design time data. But actually all I'm going to do is add myself another um, application bar um, button. Uh, which is, uh, so I've already got two buttons on my application bar. Uh, I'll do this through the properties menu because it's nice and easy in there. Application bar. Why am I got no properties? What's going on? Application bar. Show the application bar. This is not good news. Um, try. Uh, yeah. I'll get rid of this this instance thing. It's it's the design time data. I don't know if that's upsetting. Right, right, right. Uh, where, where's my design time data gone? Man. Oh, there we go. Okay. Get rid of this. Is a it would have given a lovely design time experience if it worked. Oh, actually, I think it's it's this. We good? Yay! There we go. Yay. Even got design time experience. Okay, so um, there's my uh, design time experience. Let's zoom that so we can actually see something useful. And um, I was trying to add an app bar button. As you can see, we've got two already. Um, here's my shell application bar. Thank you. Buttons. Let's go off to the uh, editor and add ourselves another one. Add an application bar button. We have the icon URI, which is going to be um, share. I'm going to share this photo I've just taken. That's the idea, anyway. Uh, but I want to do it look, using the Swizzy new share contract, which is really cool. So um, where's my? Uh, where's that one gone? It's gone in the middle. Okay, that that'll, that'll be all right. Share and um, um, call it share app bar button. And we're going to uh, hook up a click event handler on it, and there we go. And uh, uh, we need to put some um, some code into this. Um, so first of all, this is the share button. Um, I, it, first of all, I need to uh, uh, call um, data transfer manager, which is a new API, one of the WinR2. This is the share contract side of things. So I'm going to resolve that reference. Um, dot show share UI. And that's going to start the whole sharing process. Now in order to do sharing as a share source, you need to hook up some event handlers. So um, I want my, where's my on navigated to? Uh, not find. Uh, have I got them? On navigated to. Here we go. Um, and in here I'm going to hook up um, an event handler for the uh, data requested event. Uh, so I go um, uh, data transfer manager dot get for current view uh, dot data requested event and I go plus equals there we go and oh heck heck try that again I got a bit hasty there plus equals tab to insert yes have you done it plus all oh, right, thank you. Did it a second <laughs> attempt. Um, there we go. So I've got my, I've got that, and actually I'm going to just. Gosh, it's difficult working at this resolution, isn't it? Uh, copy that line, and I, I need to un, unhook it as well when we go out. I haven't got an on navigated to at the moment, so I'm going to go override on navigated from. I mean, it's what I meant to say, navigated from, um, and just paste that in, but change it to a minus equal, so we unsubscribe again. Mm. Uh, okay, now, um, in my data requested, I'm going to, um, I'm just going to paste in uh, a, some code, share source in Silverlight, which is going off to get a user image. Um, I need to put uh, an async on that, because we've got all sorts of um, Awaitables that we're calling, and we need to resolve the st storage, windows.storage. And uh, this is all common code, Windows, this is all WinRT code. This is all the new new APIs. It's all exactly the same as you would use in a, a WinRT XAML app or a Windows 8 app, but it's here in a Silverlight app, and that's going to be, uh, that's going to call out to a share. So, hey, let's have a go at this now. Um, so, I'm going to go off and run my app. 
we go off and choose a, a recipe, uh, quiche Lorraine, we think that's pretty cool, so we take a picture, uh, there's our beautiful quiche Lorraine that we've just, uh, we've just uh, uh, made, isn't that lovely? And then we think, ah oh, yeah, I'm gonna have to share this, and it says preparing content to share, and now you can share it out to all of these different share sources, like NFC or to or to OneNote. Let's share it with OneNote, and then and then here we go. There's our lovely picture in OneNote. So, and that's taking advantage of all the really cool uh, sh uh, the, sh the share contract stuff that's in Windows Phone 8.1, which is much more flexible than we had in Windows Phone 8 Silverlight. Yeah, I think it, one of the fun things about Silverlight with Silverlight 8.1 that we're seeing in these demos is the fact that it's kind of like, uh, in many cases, it's, it's like the uh, Windows and Windows Phone, where uh, as a general rule, most of the stuff you've got, a lot of the stuff, that, uh, the, the APIs that we've been showing you these last three days are things where it comes into, into Silverlight and uh, just, just kind of by default. And it's really, you're looking for the exceptions to the rule, but the rule is, if you had it in uh, Windows Runtime XAML, you're going to have it in Silverlight. Yep, yeah, that's right. Right, so um, I'm actually going to kind of backtrack a bit now and have a look at why that app didn't work right when we re restarted it. And that's because the, there are some changes speaking when you go to Silverlight 8.1. Huh? <laughs> speaking of exceptions. Yes, yeah, speaking of exceptions. Yes, here we go. Um, okay, so let's look at the... In the there are some changes to the, the actual app lifecycle when you go into Silverlight 8.1. First of all, the back key terminates the app just the same as Silverlight 8.0. Now, so actually that's not a change. That's not a difference. So I don't know why I'm no. saying it. <laughs> it's different from Windows Runtime XAML apps, which uh, if you followed us, if you've been following the, uh, the jump start, you know that the back key in a WinRT XAML app actually suspends the app and goes back to the previous app. Um, Silverlight 8.0, even when you move to Silverlight 8.1, you've got the same back key handling that you've always had. So it will navigate back through the page stack. And when you get to the home page, um, it will, okay, here's a difference. It will, on a Silverlight 8.0, it would terminate the app. If you go back from the home, the launch page of an app, that would kill the app in Silverlight 8.0. In Silverlight 8.1, it doesn't. It does, looks the same because it closes the app, but actually the app is suspended. Just the same as a WinRT XAML app. So that's a change. Now, if you don't like that, hang on, I'm getting this wrong, aren't I? <sighs> Sorry, let me backtrack, backtrack. Yeah. Okay, start from that 30 seconds ago. So the Windows Runtime XAML apps suspend. The Silverlight apps by default um, do retain their normal behavior, which means when you get to the launch page of the app and you hit the user hits back, the app terminates. If you want to keep the same behavior as, um, uh, as Windows Runtime apps, uh, you can, there's a navigation service dot pause on back method that you, uh, uh, property that you can set to true in your app.xaml. Uh, and that will cause it to suspend and not terminate. Um, and the other one is Silverlight 8.1 apps resume instead of replace on relaunch. And this is actually why our app failed when I first ran it that time. Uh, we have this thing in Silverlight 8 that actually not many people took advantage of called Fast Application Resume which is kind of like the WinRT XAML app behavior. It means that if you've got a suspended copy of your app, that thing where in Silverlight apps where the user taps the, the main tile, the primary tile, of the, or taps a tile for the app, or uh, goes to the programs menu and selects the app from there, it would destroy the suspended version and launch a whole new copy of it. So with fast application resume in Windows Phone 8, you could change that behavior. So instead, if there was a suspended version, it would resume that one and not destroy it and create a whole new instance. That now is the only option for Silverlight 8.1 apps. You've got far, you don't have any choice. <laughs> so this is how you used to do it in Windows Phone 8. You had to go into manually edit the manifest and say, I want this activation policy equals resume. Um, and uh, it, there's performance advantages to this, of course. It means, you know, you can, you've got one sitting there and suspended. Just reuse it. But, of course, you've got to be aware that your app, app is going to behave like that. Um, so we've now only got FAR, which means, effectively, like this. You launch a, uh, an app, any old app, uh, a Silverlight 8.1 app. Um, your user launches another app, and so your app gets suspended, like he's now using running the calculator. And then your user comes along and decides they want to launch from the apps menu the same app again, your far one. Now, in the old ways, it would have blown away that, that suspended version, but now it just, re, just re, re inflates it, it re reactivates it. 
So what do you need to do about this uh, as a Silverlight app developer? Well, most of the time, not a lot, although as we've seen, um, we, we've got a little bit of an issue. App templates, you know, the new app templates already have code in them to uh, actually make it look to the user. Actually, although the app is being resumed, they kind of unwind the, the, the uh, navigation history of that suspended version and throw away the state. So effectively, the app will look like it's relaunching. Uh, and actually, that's why my Contoso cookbook, right in the first demo, ended up on the regions page. That is the launch page of the app. But actually, we have a problem because there's no data being shown. Um, so there is already in the initialized phone application method, which is in your app.xaml.cs, um, this, this root frame.navigated plus equals check for reset navigation. If you go and have a study of, you know, create any old new Silverlight app and go and dig down into app.xaml.cs, you'll see this and a bunch of other methods that are related to it. They're all about giving this on resume, make it look like you're starting again behavior, which is kind of what users um, uh, have expected with Silverlight 8.0 apps. Now, the interesting thing about this is that WinRT apps tend to resume and actually will tend to pick up where you where you were last. And they're kind of they're, the framework running WinRT XAML apps is more geared to the uh, to the experience of hey, just put them straight back where they were, regardless. So you always go back to the same page that they were on last. And in both cases, you might want to think about that. If, if they haven't run the app for quite a long time, for a few days or something, does it make sense to put them back on the same page they were on four days ago? Probably not. You probably want to start them from the home page. So you want to, in both cases, with RT XAML apps, you might want to override the kind of built-in behaviors that the framework, and the classes and the navigation helper and all that suspension manager gives you in order to not resume at the right page. And in Silverlight apps, you might want to override the behavior that are built into these templates and say, um, when you are resuming in a short time period after the last time that they were running the app, you actually do go back to the same page. So uh, either way, you're going to have to think about this. Um, so let's just go and fix my app over here. Um, the problem as it happens is um, can be illustrated by going to main page. Uh, the, the main page is the one that shows the regions. Um, and in my on navigated to method, um, I'll set a breakpoint on it and we can have a look at what's going on. So let's run it. Uh, actually, what's going to happen now? Because it was, it was still suspended, wasn't it? It was still running effectively. Um, we've got a progress indicator. Um, oh yeah, so let me, let me, re let me backtrack because that didn't really show what I wanted to do. So um, I, I want to go back. I want to uh, basically make sure my Contoso cookbook isn't running at all. Let's just make sure it's dead. It is. It's not there. Good. We're good. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not running. Um, so I'm going to run it from cold. This is a this is a fresh run of the app, the start. And you'll see this first thing it says is, is the app recipes data loaded? If it's not, then we go through and we set up a progress indicator and then we load the data and uh, and then you know everything happens as we expect and we get our recipes details on the on the screen if we now suspend the app and go off and launch effectively a new instance of it we're back on our breakpoint but at this point the is loaded is still true because we've Actually, instead of launching a whole new copy where is loaded would be false, we've reinflated. We we got the suspended one back. So we're not actually doing what all this stuff. We're not doing the lines just above there where we're loading our data in and then and then uh, putting it onto the page. So um, so this is why we end up with with not that one, that one. <laughs> this is why we. Oh, hang on. I'm still I'm still stuck on this. This is why we end up with a completely failed demo. It's meant to be blank. That then yeah. we do that again. Uh, let's go over to recipes and uh, take that and uh, pick my recipe. Take a photograph. Uh, then we're in, taking a photograph and then then we're going to launch launch a new instance of it while that is going on and let it run and. There we go. So that's the that's the problem. So we just need to fix that navigation because what's what's going on is the uh, the app templates. Just to um, drill that home. So um, if I can if I can make sure I'm following, uh, 
the recipes is loaded, that property has been persisted. Yeah. But not the items property on... So, yeah, so let me go back to the... Yeah, you're right to call me out on that. So the... Um, Sorry, okay. Um, oh yeah, here we go. Look, when, when the recipe data is loaded, uh -huh. we're executing this. So app.recipe fires an event when it finishes loading its data. Yep. So it fire, this event handler would fire if it loaded the data, and that is what sets the data context on the list oh. so that we show the data. I got you. So we've okay, kind of got, okay, okay. We've got a subtle hidden problem here. So actually what we need to do to fix this is to... Um, uh, we, and, I need to backtrack a bit because this is this is the plumbing code that's already in. This is a standard template new application stuff. And if you expand this down here, we've got a check for reset navigation. This is what fires when you get an active reactivation from far, which is the only thing that happens these days. Mm -hmm. If we get a navigation mode reset, which means a far reactivation. Then we clear the navigation back stack, so it's clearing all the navigation history out okay. and removes any back entries. So we end up with a clear, a clear back stack, no, no cached pages. And then we navigate forward to our main page again and with a new navigation. So what we need to do is put a little bit of something like this that says um, um, we probably want to do something like else. Um, if, we got, if we're on a new navigation, um, if e dot navigation mode is uh, a new nav navigation, which means we, we you know it's just starting a new rather than um, not rather than going back into the page, uh, then we then we want to uh, actually use that loaded data that's still in memory, the uh, our app data, and reset the uh, the data context. So we go list okay. groups uh, list groups dot data context um, is equal to um, our app dot recipes which is already loaded so okay, okay. and then and then it'll all, it'll all just work then so the so the, the data is still in memory the properties are still in memory but the data context hasn't been set for the page yeah exactly that, okay right. that makes that's lots right. of sense that's right got it okay yeah, it. so uh, yeah let's just repeat that scenario take a photograph uh, while we're in the middle of all that and it's suspended of course while they were in the uh, the camera picker um, then we go to uh, contest a cookbook uh, okay, it's not absolutely brilliant user experience because you see the other page flash up there. Right, right. But at least we're we're back into like normal. No, you know, so we've had a fresh restart. Okay, so that was kind of interesting. All right. Okay. Um, now a couple of other things I'm going to call out about using new APIs that are kind of related to the app lifecycle. First of all, the the share contract. Um, as if you're a share target, you're going to get activated to handle a share. And you can also, if you use the file open picker, file safe picker, or the web authentication broker, then these have these and continue methods that we talked about in other sessions. So they, they actually, and they all work in WinRT. These are the WinRT API's behavior for Windows Phone, whether you're running in a WinRT XAML app or in a Silverlight app. Um, but the reason why I'm calling it out is that what happens is you call file open picker dot pick file and continue and at that point your app suspends and tra control transfers over to the shell UI that handles the uh, allows the user to pick where they want to uh, to choose which where they want to pick the file from it could be an app or it could be from the phone and all this time your source app is suspended and then when they've picked a file it, then it returns and reactivates your app so that you can be handed over that file and use it um, and there's a new um, activation for that contract activated. And again, if you create, if you um, if you add a new project for Silverlight 8.1, if you look in app.xaml.cs, you'll see in the initialized phone application this other event handler shown at the bottom there. Contract activated is already hooked up. It's an empty event handler. You still got to obviously write your code in there. Uh, and if you're upgrading an 8.0 app to 8.1, you'll need to add this in. And then this is how it works. And this is take an example of the file open picker. Um, and it's different from Windows. I mean, I've shown this slide before because I drive this home. On Windows, you just call open picker dot pick single file async. It, the source app waits, and when they finish, you get the file back, and away you go, and you keep doing your file processing with the one that they've picked. 
on Windows Phone, whether it's a WinRT app or a Silverlight app, um, you uh, call pick single file and continue. And this is the reason why I've got this difference in the APIs is because of the need to support these low memory devices, a 512 meg uh, low end phones. So your app maybe is suspended and maybe terminated, and then later on when they have picked the file, you're going to be reactivated. And the way it works on Silverlight is like this. We've got our contract activated event handler, and in there you'll be passed in uh, an I activated event args object of some kind. Uh, for the different activations, there will be a, a specific concrete type that you are passed in, so you need to find out which it is. So that's what the first line in contract activated is doing. Finding out is it a file open pick a continuation event args? If it is, well, we just store in, in the Silverlight way, we just store that event args object in a public property on our app class. So that's all we do. And then we, uh, then normal Silverlight um, page navigation activation stuff will automatically, because it's been suspended, it will automatically resume you back at the page where you were when you were suspended, which is the same page where you called the uh, file picker API. So then, in your on navigated to, you just need to have a little bit of code like this that sort of says, oh, okay, thank you, uh, I'm, I'm starting again. Is this because of a file picker continuation? Or is it because I've just been navigated to normally? So you can look at that file picker continue, the, uh, the, the property on the app class that you added there. Has it got a value in it? If it has, you know that this is a, uh, a file open picker continuation. So then you can just carry on with processing the file. Um, actually, what's not shown there as well is after you've processed it, you probably ought to say set app.filepicker continuation args to null to avoid a, a, a inappropriate uh, activation of this code uh, later on. And you can implement the provider side as well. So you can be a, an app, in, you can create a Silverlight app that is a share target and a file open picker provider, one of the apps the user can choose to. to select in order to pick a file. So you can be the, the app that provides the uh, UI that the user uses to pick a file. So they're available. I'm not going to go into any details on them. Um, I'll leave that. Um, it's the same, actually, the same demo I showed in the WinRT ones, but just okay. the Silverlight favorite. Okay. Uh, the, it's in the sample code. Um, I'm going to move on and uh, just uh, get so we can finish on time. <laughs> Uh, WNS. Okay, this is a this is an interesting yeah interesting topic. So in a Silverlight eight zero app, you use MPNS or MNS, Microsoft Push Notification Services, which was is the push was cr the push created for Windows Phone zero, uh, seven and it has been obviously with us for a few years now. Um, in a Silverlight eight point one app, you can choose to use MPNS or WNS. Uh, it's actually not quite. I mean, it, that's an awe from an API's point of view. So you, what your code that uses push notifications will run just the same in a Silverlight 8.1 app. Actually, under the covers, it's using WNS. You are running on WNS once you retarget a Silverlight 8.1. So this is just, um, it's just about the APIs you're choosing to use. You can leave all your push notification code just fine. Uh, there are a few changes, some, some, property, some methods you call that you would normally have you could have expected a sort of true false response from they will always look in the documentation but basically it means your your code should just run if you stay with mpns however if you choose to switch over to the wns apis as well remember it's wns under the covers but this is your programming interface that we're talking about if you switch over to the wns kind of app the programming apis you get access to all of the wns goodness which is a lot of it so you, can, you can't use both together. You've got to choose one or other from a programming API's point of view. And WNS is better. I mean, yeah. but you're not forcing you to go there. So it's much more reliable. Notifications get there faster. You don't need any certificates. Um, it's obviously all your code is converged with, uh, it's a WinRT um, WNS code. So it's, it's just very reusable across um, universal apps and uh, and uh, got a lot of extra features as well. Now, the way you select, I mean, when you upgrade an app, and just switch back over to here, this guy. When you upgrade an app, where's my... Um, oh, you go, you go to your... Not that one. WM app manifest. This notification drop down here, it will stay on MPN by default. But if you want to switch to WNS, you just simply, you just simply click that other one. It's, there's more to it than that, of course. It's not just a case of selecting the right drop down. No. But that's where you start. That's the starting point. 
Um, and you need to go in and specify your tile and icon. Once you switch over to WNS, you, you need to supply all of these visual elements. Um, some that you can specify through the, nav the uh, manifest editor, and some that you have to go in and manually edit. Um, but you need to supply all the right artwork. Now, the other things are, um, once you switch over to WNS, you need to set that toast capable equals true in the package.apex manifest file if you start using WNS toast. And the tiles are not, once you switch over, we're not talking about a trivial thing here because your cycle tiles are not supported, your flip tiles are not supported, so you've got to change over to things like tile notification queues and the peak template, for example. So you've got to choose one of the WNS templates. And also when you're creating tiles, you've still got to remember to use the Silverlight um, page-centric navigation model. So uh, that's different from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, from WNS where you just pass, um, uh, what is it, you pass a sort of string or... Um, different, something different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now this, this here's a little. Th oh yeah, the, actually, I'm gonna the second book bottom bullet point. I'm gonna come back to in a minute. I want to talk about the bottom one first. Even when you've switched all of your code away from MPNS and you now think you've got everything is all WNS, make sure you haven't even got any left any using statements in. Because if you've even got yeah. a using statement, even if you're not actually using any of the APIs, it will still pull in the wrong namespaces and uh, chaos will happen. So you've got to make sure you completely cleanse your code of any references <laughs> to MPNS. The other one, the request, request create async thing to pin a secondary tile. Um, that's interesting. So. And this is a problem that actually is not specific to Silverlight. It's actually s true of any phone apps, even WinRT apps on Windows Phone. And the problem here is that it, this same code here is code is WNS code that you could have in a Windows app. A Windows app can pin a secondary tile using this code, and this exact same code will compile and, in, and will appear to run in a Windows Phone app. But actually what's happening is, so you're creating a new secondary tile at the top there. Now, when you create a new secondary tile, there, there are, you're fairly limited in the customizations on that tile. So what typically happens is you create your tile. You then call tile.requestCreateAsync in a Windows app, and you await it. The tile gets pinned, and then you do some other stuff to update it. You might go off and you know, read a file and get an image and do some other stuff. Render some demo. Yeah, up. whatever. Yeah, you customize it. On phone... Because the shell behavior is different, when you pin a secondary tile, your app suspends. And that's, that is Windows Phone behavior. It suspends your app and the user is taken back to the start screen. They can see their new tile. It's, it's the way that the phone works with secondary tiles. It always has done that. Which means your app is suspended. That does mean that the, any code you've got in your code that you've just pulled across from your Windows app, after that request create async, well, it may or may not execute. There's actually a little bit, you know, it, it, you've, you've got that little window between calling request create async and the app being suspended. So it depends how lengthy that code is as to whether or not it's going to complete. But it, what you mustn't do really is it rely on that executing. So what you need to do is uh, in your app class, put a static, an action um, property on it. An action is something you can assign a, a method to, and it will execute the code when the action gets, um, gets executed. So you have an action property, which will be null to begin with. And then, oh, I didn't say, oh, let me say. And then this bit down here, you will actually put into um, an action. Let me show you the demo. This is actually a sample that you can go and download, a standard sample. Uh, so... You can go and pull this down. It's actually a Silverlight 81 sample, tile update after deactivation. Now I have actually cheated a little bit. So there's two scenarios. Let me just run it on the emulator. Um, two scenarios. You can pin the tile and update immediately. So run the code immediately. That's the one I'm going to show you first. So you pin the tile here, and then um, I'm actually I've put a little delay in because unfortunately the emulator's too fast, and this yeah. does actually work, which kind of spoils my demo. So then we're going to go off and update it a bit, but you can imagine this simulating some lengthy work, such as you've gone off to a web service or opened a file, done some stuff that's significant. Um, and so we can do that, and we just make sure the tile's not pinned, and you can pin the tile and then try and run that code to update it, which the tile is, is already, and you see we've got the original tile, it's not been updated at all. Um, I can go back into the app actually just by pinning it and then go back to the better way which is, up, oh hang on, updated, what on the, let me just, 
run it again. So you saw the updated one. So it did actually get, get to the river. Right? And then do the other one, you pin an update on scenario on the deactivated. And I'll show you the code in a minute. So you pin it, and scenario two's tile is already up, is updated. So what happened in scenario two, the right way of doing it, is that we've got our request delete async and nothing after it. But what we have done is we have um, set up on this page a, if I can find it, where do we set the action? Pin and update clink. Uh, yeah, here we go. App on new tile pinned is equal to update tile. Update tile is that method, go to definition, which does the, uh, the updating which is the stuff we were trying to do after it was pinned before. So there we go, lots of notifications to update the tile. And we, so what we're doing is we're deferring all that, we're putting it to an action on app. So what we do in app.xaml.cs is there's that property that we set on update to into. But then in a, we find our application deactivated. So this will fire as your app is being suspended. We say, is this action property, if it's not null, then we execute it. So, and then we clear it just so we don't have any false, false positives later on. So in the application deactivated, we're doing the update, uh, updating the tile afterwards. So it's kind of a bit, wow. bit it's, yeah. It's, it's like just in time compilation. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's something like that. So it's weird and wacky stuff. So this is, and, and I call that out, I say it's not specifically a Silverlight problem. It's a phone app WinRT API tiles problem. And I call it out here because if you are doing this navigation from, uh, you know, you're moving from MPNS to uh, WNS, this is something you might trip, about, trip up with your copying code from Windows. And you think, oh, that should work, you know. So just be aware there's some differences there. Uh, just lastly, a couple of words on app submission. Um, Silver 8.1 apps run on 8.1 phones only. You can actually submit up to the store a 7.x version of your app, an 8.0 version of your app, and an 8.1 version of your app. To, to and each, if if uh, you know an 8.0 user will get the 8.0 version of it, an 8.1 phone owner will get the 8.1. So you've got apps supporting all of the phones that are out there at the moment. So that's certainly possible. Um, there is a bit of man. Unfortunately, the tooling has let us down just a little bit. Silver 8.1 apps require that you must manually edit package.apex manifest before submission. Uh, there's a topic, prepare your Windows Phone Silver 8.1 app for publishing in the MSDN that takes you through it. But essentially, it's you reserve an app name in the store. You have to note that and you have to make a note of that app name and that package identity name and the publisher name in the store once you've reserved the name. Make a note of all of them, and then you come in and manually edit your Apex manifest, and you have to really plug, you have to cut and paste those values in here. This is a package not Apex manifest, and the publisher name goes in there, and the app name needs to go to one other place as well, which is in your WM app manifest or XML in there. So unfortunately, it's a bit manual. We, we're sorry, but it's, <laughs> it didn't make it into the tooling. So uh, that's for Windows Phone 8, Silverlight 8.1 apps only. So, in summary, which frame, XAML framework should you use? Ah, oh, whichever, whichever you want. We've got loads. Which one would you like? I've got loads of XAML frameworks. Um, for a new app, choose, choose between WinRT or Silverlight, depending on uh, which you feel more comfortable with. Uh, WinRT opens, obviously, the opportunity up for universal apps. If you've got an existing Windows Store app, it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah. Um, but obviously, if you choose WinRT, it's only going to run on 8.1 phones. That's one, yeah. one consideration. Um, if you need, if you want to use a lock screen image or cameras, some of these features that are Silverlight only, you can go for Silverlight 8.0 or, or Silverlight 8.1. Um, music app, background audio, then you'll you'll have to use Silverlight 8.0 or WinRT APIs for that. Um, and existing Silverlight phone apps you're upgrading, well, yeah, um, Silverlight 8, um, 8 one or um, or you could choose a migration to WinRT, but that's yep. absolutely non-trivial. So. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, the closest uh, correspondence you would see is what we saw in the Universal Ops demo, yeah. where I have the linked files and the PCL, and that that would be if I was if I was doing a migration from a Windows 8 application, I would do a, a very serious refactor, pull things out, put them in a PCL, and start. Uh, it's, it's yeah. If, yeah. if you haven't got it, if you're, if you're not starting from a good place in terms of the structure <laughs> right. of your yes. apps, very much so. Yeah.
Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, astonishingly, um, there we go. We've, 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 with Windows Phone 8.1, you know, we, we've got two XAML frameworks. We are protecting your investment, your skill set if you're a Silverlight developer. We're also giving you a great route forward to universal apps with uh, uh, WinRT uh, XAML for uh, building apps that each share loads of code between Windows and Windows Phone. Um, it's a great, great uh, uh, product, and uh, that is the end of the jump start. Uh, we have finally reached the end. If you've been with us, all the way through, uh, congratulations! And Yay. if you are, how you come to this and you've been through the uh, the videos, watching this after the event uh, through MVA, uh, welcome to the end. And for us, I'd just like to say uh, thank you so much for for watching. I hope you've all learned something useful. Um, I guess is there a survey again? Probably, Probably <laughs> a survey. We're told if there is a survey, please uh, let us know um, uh, if this was useful to you. Yes. Yep. There is a survey, so yes, if you could please uh, answer the survey. Um, we'll stay online for a little bit and answer, answer any questions. Um, and other than that, it's just time to say uh, thank you and goodbye. Yep.